Well, hello, welcome to this video. I want to take you back to September 1962. The space race was in full swing and Telstar was dominating the airwaves. I don't remember much about September 1962 because I was eight years old and at school in the picturesque Yorkshire Dales. But the man who created Telstar was a guy called Joe Meek who I came into contact with in a very strange way. I'll tell you about it towards the end. He was born in a rural part of Gloucestershire. Joe Meek was a bit of an electronics whiz kid. Apparently, this is a bit of rumor stroke legend. Apparently, as a child, he put together the first working television in his village. That was back in the 30s. During national service, he was involved with radar. And when he left the RAF, he became an electrical engineer and then got into sound engineering, working for, amongst other people, Radio Luxembourg in the early days. The first hit he actually produced, though officially the engineer, this track by Humphrey Littleton. Bad Penny Blues back in 1956. This sounds incredibly modern and that's a testament to Joe Meek's talent that he played with the sound and made it sound like this. And he changed the piano to his up. Don't forget, Humphrey Littleton was a trumpet player, and so he wouldn't really go for that. And apparently, Humphrey Littleton hated it, and the first chance he got, he re-recorded it. But the thing was, this was a huge hit because it sounded new and exciting. In 1961, Joe Meek, financed by major banks, Joe was still searching for the next hit, not just for himself, but for all of us. So when you're down in the pub or playing darts or whatever it is you boys do, Joe is working. Setting up RGM Sound in number 304 Holloway Road. I know it is because I went around it after it had closed, but 304 Holloway Road is where Joe Meek set up RGM Sound, which was his record studio come production center which back then was very advanced, even though it was a pretty Heath Robinson setup. Back then, being a record producer usually involved just switching on the tapes and turning things up and down. But Joe Meek gave it a whole new meaning. And it's largely thanks to Joe Meek that we have things like, well, the advances in reverb, overdubbing and sampling he was the pioneer and the master of all that. George Martin thought he was being um, very clever when he recorded two things on the same track. Joe Meek was doing doubling up and traveling up and all kinds of things. It's all done in Joe Meek's flat in Holloway Road. He met the drummer was in the bathroom, the console was in a separate room, and then a few rooms away, there'd be the singer and the band would be playing down in the basement or something. And it was all done like that. Very Heath Robinson, as I say. This video is not over yet, so please don't go away. I just wanted to stop and say that if you like this video, please like it, subscribe, press the notification bell, because all that helps. And also, I've now got a Patreon page, and you can donate as little as a pound a month, and you can get extra videos, you can get articles, all kinds of things from me, and it helps me keep going with this YouTube channel. Thank you again, and um, let's go back to Joe Meek. You've got to bear in mind that Joe Meek was just more than the producer. He was in charge of everything. He created the sound. He found the artist, he gave him the song, basically, and he recorded it his way. His first number one hit at Holloway Road was Johnny Remember Me by John Layton in 1961. But of course, it wasn't all easy sailing for Joe Meek. He was gay. At the time, homosexuality was illegal in Britain, and sex between two consenting males could get you landed in jail. And Joe Meek wasn't exactly, shall we say, secretive about his being gay. Telstar may be in a big hit, but he didn't get any money for it because a French composer claimed that it was stolen from him. And that court case dragged on and on and on. Joe ran his studio in a very strange way. He had a fondness, shall we say, for young men. Creamy Lord Such, David Such, who was um, on the edge of that world, told me a few things 
about it later and I'll tell you one of the things he told me at the end of this. It was a hub of creativity and also a bit of naughtiness at the same time. Downstairs, which was a leather shop at the time, became a bank. It was a Lloyds Bank, I think, and that's when I went around there because in the mid-90s when I worked at Time Out, the bank was moving out and the premises had been sold. So we had a chance to go and look at it and it hadn't been changed much. It, the upstairs bit had been made into a flat for the manager or the assistant manager of the bank. And so the flat upstairs was virtually unchanged for when Joe Meek was there. So I went there with Screaming Lord Such. had a little chat, he showed me where everything was, and I got a really good mental picture. This is on a Sunday in 1994, I think it was. John Repsch, author of the book about Joe Meek, was also there. Then we went for a cup of tea. Another thing that David Such told me about Joe Meek was he was very superstitious, and he had a thing about um, the other world and the supernatural and things like that. And he claimed that he could communicate with the dead and he held seances and he told David that he had a seance where he summoned up the ghost of Buddy Holly. He said that Buddy Holly gave him some ideas. No boy, with you and me, no boy. As time went on, Joe was struggling financially. Even though Telstar was number one in Britain, the United States, most of Europe, Australia, New Zealand. He never received a penny until after his death, which means he never received a penny. A French composer claimed that the tune had been ripped off from a film score for the cock gaze dragged on, and eventually when it was settled after Joe's death, the estate received what would have been something like three million pounds today, quite a lot. He was living hand to mouth and the bailiffs and things kept turning up and he kept, and I know he owed his landlady rent for a while and he had rows with his boyfriend, including Heinz, and Heinz moved out and stuff like that. And it was, because Heinz apparently, I was speaking to Wilco Johnson, because Wilco Johnson backed Heinz in the very early days and he told me that Heinz told him that he was totally straight and that Joe Meek could never accept that he was straight. Now, I don't know about that, but I would suggest that maybe there was a little bit of a bisexuality, Let's, but um, who knows, eh? Who knows? He also became paranoid. He thought that there were people listening to him and he... There's a guy called Patrick Pink who was working with Joe, who was like an engineer, and he, he says that on the 3rd of February, which is the fateful day, Joe called down from upstairs, he was working downstairs, and Joe called down. After eating his breakfast, which apparently the last breakfast he had was toast and coffee. There you go. The breakfast of champions. And he went upstairs again, called down a bit later and asked him to get the landlady in. So Patrick Pink, Scott landlady, she was going up the stairs to speak to Joe. Apparently she asked, was he in a bad mood? And Patrick said, yes, I think he is, because he thinks people are listening to him. So she says, don't worry, I'll sort him out. So she goes up the stairs. Next thing he knows is a big bang shotgun. Joe Meek has shot the landlady, who then tumbled down the stairs and into Patrick Pink's arms, according to his testimony. And then as he watched Joe Meek raise the gun, step backwards, and there's a big almighty bang, he put down the landlady, went upstairs and saw that um, Joe Meek had literally blown off his head. Screaming Lord Such told me there were a lot of rumours, he said. People suspected that Heinz had been there at the time and it was actually Heinz who had shot the landlady. And then Joe Meek had killed himself to take the blame away from Heinz because he still loved Heinz and all that stuff. So David Such ended his life tragically as well. He apparently committed suicide at his mother's home by hanging himself off the balcony. Time stayed in the flat and he left his shotgun there. Now, I lived in London for a long time and I never, ever, ever knew anybody who owned a shotgun in the middle of London. Now, I know that Joe Meek and Hines were like country boys, but even so, it does pose a question to me. Thank you for watching. Right to the end, don't get my Patreon page and I hope to see you later. And thank you very much. Goodbye.